I was wondering from your perspective, your knowledge of the context, what you think South Sudanese perceptions of reconciliation are. So is there a strong sense coming from certain individuals or groups in the communities about what that would be, what, what would look like reconciliation for them? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, th I think there's, at the moment, there's probably two dominant narratives. Uh, one is, uh, of course, the counter narrative to dialogue, which is, uh, I think, putting those who are looking for a middle ground or some kind of a, a space to, to uh, reconcile their views or their, their grievances or whatever it may be. So I think that, that counter narrative, of course, is one which is uh, filled with kind of black and white imagery uh, of violence and the need to, to defend at all costs ident certain identities in, in South Sudan. So I think that, that puts reconciliation into its own context in South Sudan right now, uh, whereas before you know, those tensions hadn't broken out. Um, there was a lot more space to be able to maneuver and to create those forums. Uh, now, the idea of people choosing to step into those uh, forums or those spheres is, of course, it's a very big life choice, I think. Uh, one that denotes that you are taking a political stance. Um, it can be in interpreted or misinterpreted. Um, so I think that puts a lot of additional pressure on people who are thinking about reconciliation. Um, and the fact that they are perceived to be, if you like, undermining uh, a, a dominant political narrative, um, either on one side or the other. Um, so I think it's, it's a very difficult personal choice that's being made. I think communities are probably less or, or, or more averse to now participating in this, uh, this idea of reconciliation than, than they would ever have been, mm. because their leaders, so the leadership, the military, the political are demanding of them a firm position in support of political goals and military goals. Uh, that's a further challenge in terms of the environment, the context. Um, but having said that, I think um, at least all the South Sudanese that I've spoken to at, at various levels uh, all recognize that there will, there will and there is a need, uh, there will be and there is a need for reconciliation and for, mm -hmm. for people to, at an individual, individual level, at an institutional level, mm -hmm. at a communal level, at a political level, they, they need to have that reconciliation and that actually without that, South Sudan will not be able to move any, any, in any direction. Um, so I think that the, the idea of creating that space is, is, is recognized as the paramount kind of next step for South Sudan, uh, more importantly than, I think, constitutional review, more mm -hmm. importantly than elections in many ways, more importantly than any other kind of, um, if you like, pillar of, of, of uh, building uh, the state or the nation for that matter. Um, I, 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 I fear that there are different narratives or different layers of uh, what we call reconciliation spaces. Of course, there's the EGAD space where it's very politicized, it's uh, elite driven, and that when they talk about reconciliation under those circumstances, I don't think that really instills in me a great sense of confidence that that's what we should be looking for ultimately, or South Sudanese are looking for. Um, for themselves, we, they know how those spheres work. You know, they had Naivasha, uh, you know, the comprehensive peace agreements. You know, years and years and years were, at the end of the day, constructed something that was good for the elites, the the, the political and military leadership. I think South Sudanese in general are looking for an ability to live with their neighbours. My fear is that if we see it as an exclusively a local space, grassroots space, I think we've also misinterpreted. The dynamics in South Sudan for the last, you know, fifty more years. And I think we need to be looking at something that's comprehensive, that is multi-layered, and it's complex. Um, that allows for the politicians to look each other in the eye, and allows for the military to look each itself in the eye. But at the same time, it allows for for you know communities to say, well, we need to be able to find a compromise position, mm -hmm. and all of those need to be linked. Um, so from EGAD all the way down to the grassroots, there needs to be some kind of a a a layered series of conversations that, that are linked to one another and influence one another towards a, a positive outcome, a, a, a sustainable yeah. outcome. Um, so in short, I think every South Sudanese disease is, is looking to that, but uh, many of them don't see the possibility right now. Um, unless they were to see that space expanding and um, unless the messages were more comprehensive, got out more, 
into the rural areas, which is I think what the the platform is aiming to do now is to build up this kind of this messaging, yeah. oral messaging, not newspapers and yeah. websites, which go only to about twenty percent of the population. I wonder if you have some thoughts about how specific types of mechanisms and interventions would contribute to that ongoing conversation that you see needing to be interconnected across the levels. I mean, I'm thinking here of a current kind of trend or, or kind of movement towards seeing a much more holistic interconnected approach to transitional contexts. Mm -hmm. And whether you see a role for prosecutions, for example, truth-telling exercises, mm -hmm. how they would fit with that sort of vision or um, need for reconciliation as you've mm -hmm. outlined specifically for South Sudan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the real, that's the big question, I think, right now is, is you know, justice with the big J, the international justice, which, which of course, I think is, a, is, a, is a, an instrument currently um, driven by, by powerful countries um, to force a political compromise or even perhaps a solution that excludes certain leadership from accessing future layers of power. Um, so I think that's one aspect of it. I think it's. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's not helpful. Uh, I certainly think that leaders need to be put under pressure. Um, I think what the national reconciliation process is is really about is in 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 the first instance is we can even say the process hasn't started. What it's aiming to do is to draw on South Sudanese uh, South Sudanese experiences and on on their on their interests and on their interpretation of what should happen next. And mm -hmm. I think so that this, this level of consultation um, is what we're actually in, embarking upon right now. Mm -hmm. It's not even to say we have a firm um, formula in terms of what the process will look like, who will actually drive that process and so on. What we're actually doing is creating the right environment for people to come forward and say, here is what we think the problems are. Um, mm -hmm. They can personalize and say, this is what happened to me or this is what happened mm -hmm. to us. Um, and we would encourage both. And here is what we, or I think, the solution towards addressing this grievance would be. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not we're not preempting in the way that you know those international kind of conversations are doing. We're trying to force the hand. What we're trying to do is to open the space for South Sudanese to say, this is our way out. This is the way we're going to find a way out and through all of these issues. And we recognise that these are you know multi, incredibly complex series yeah. of over layers of yeah. grievances that go back decades and decades and that even the process when it's finally constructed around the aspirations and the hopes of South Sudanese would actually continue to run many many years on into the future even beyond the official kind of deadline of, of closing a process even if it went to let's mm -hmm. say five ten years beyond that it would need to continue running of course that's an experience in South Africa and many other places where in theory the process should continue towards a just uh, a policy for you know kind of a, a, a pro poor policy you know all of these things tend to be now the longer term instruments to to try and right the wrongs yeah. over the longer term. Yeah. Do you have a sense of in the next sort of few months, few years, few mm. decades, what the kind of key potential stumbling blocks might be for the type of reconciliation process that you've outlined mm. in South Sudan? Yeah, good question. Um, I think, I mean, there's a number of, of angles. One, one would be, of course, internally, uh, domestically, whether politicians will allow this to breed <laughs> without uh, either interfering or shutting it down or, or, or uh, let's say, scaring off those who, you know, by, by virtue of uh, various actions by the security forces um, or, or in, you know, kind of individuals with no name or institution kind of threatening and frightening people off. Um, I think that's one very real possibility, um, is that that, that that would undermine the confidence or the, the willingness to participate. Um, I would say another very major risk is the international community and the way it works, uh, which is to be very much in the forefront of things, wanting to kind of run and manage things, um, feeling that, I suppose, the, the underpinning of that is the kind of the lacking confidence of the abilities or the capacities of South Sudanese to actually manage everything themselves, mm -hmm. which then goes back to kind of the whole development approach or whether, you know, kind of whether we are actually allowing for a real authentic process, um, as slow as it may be, and as frustrating from our perspective that we want to see, you know, sort of very clear-cut 
Um, I, I, I hope it won't be that. I hope it'll be very messy and, uh, and very hard to discern what's actually going on by virtue of the fact that it's so complex and very, very kind of uh, uh, tangled up in, in various conversations. So I think the idea of international um, either interference could be politically could be interference by by certain countries who would want not want to see this come too fast and interfere with their designs mm. one the two would be by virtue of the way the international community designs and engages that this would actually undermine the process that might mm. kind of want to own uh, mm. rather than uh, allow others to own the process and of course that's a big problem in general for international communities it's to take a step back as you were saying mm. to kind of be in the background maybe mm. very much kind of a, but of some organizations but not all um, and then the idea of you know maybe the, the kind of the soft end of that um, would be you know kind of putting funds in but then leveraging from within mm. you know using those funds and, and, uh, and of course I, I fear that also because that's been uh, evident in South Sudan for a very long time this is kind of influencing so I, I fear those those aspects and there are many others in between.